The business that you're in is the best business to be in. You know, I've had lots of people come and see me. You know, I'd like to have my own business. But they're scared. An entrepreneur will take the leap. And if you could give us, like, the top three things you learned. If you can put the prices up, then that's the easiest way to, <laughs> yeah. to make the company more profitable. So I lost 50 million two weeks before we had to close the deal. Has right. anyone ever propositioned you because of your wealth? Hi, it's Rob Moore here, and welcome to the Disruptive Entrepreneur Video Podcast. Now, we are sat in the boardroom on the board table of one of Scotland's richest men. I believe at some stage he has been Scotland's richest man, certainly on the Scotland Times rich list. Now, his name is Jim McColl, uh, and we'll be sitting over there in a minute, and I'm interviewing him on his journey, acquiring businesses, all the way from working on cars, repairing them by the side of the road, to having a a portfolio of companies that's more than a billion pounds in turnover. We talk about being on the rich list and the upsides and the downsides of that and people management. He's a lovely, humble man. And I think a lot of people have perceptions of billionaires that they're greedy, ego-driven and power hungry. Not the many that I've met and not any that we have interviewed on The Disruptive Entrepreneur. But before we go, sit down, make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel. I've got loads of great interviews with billionaires and very successful, disruptive entrepreneurs and some left field guests as well who you think, oh, wait a minute, that seems like a weird one. And then I think you'll love it. So come down, sit with me with Jim McCall. I want to say a huge thank you for taking time in your diary to My allow pleasure. us to come and do the podcast. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, very relaxed. Um, I am fascinated that you are an esteemed company that only a very few people are in the whole world, which is, of course, a very high net worth, which is, you know, the kind of, you know, the billionaire status, et cetera. Um, and I'm fascinated to know, what does someone who's got to that level know about life that us mere mortals haven't? Like maybe a millionaire, what do they not know that someone who's worth a lot more does? I don't think they know anything. You know, I think you... You always have this mystique about, you know, if your business is bigger or you're more successful, it just gets, um, you know, you get more stuff. It gets more difficult to keep track of everything. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes you look back and wish it was simpler. Mm. Do you really, though? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Would, you, would you give it all away for it to be <laughs> more simple? <laughs> I don't, what do you mean by give it all away? Well, I mean, all, uh, all, all, all the money, the responsibilities, you know, the, no, the I, companies. I, I, you know, I really enjoy, and the, the day I stop enjoying getting up in the morning just to interact with some of the things we're doing, I'll, I will pack it in. But mm. it's more the journey that's the fun. You yeah. know, I think um, a lot of people uh, expect that when it's a destiny they're going to, but it's the journey that's mm. the real fun and excitement of it all. Mm. Do you ever sit there though and pinch yourself and go, you know, when I started all this, I would, I started from ground zero and now I'm in the times rich list in Scotland. You know, I'm, I've got, I think it's something like 80 something companies that you own or you've bought. I mean, it's well, we, uh, significant. We've, we've, we've bought a number of them. We're invested in, uh, probably at the moment, uh, five or six major groups, but they've each got, a number of businesses in them, you mm. know, so it, it's quite a number. Mm. And you don't pinch yourself. You seem so relaxed about no, it. No, I, I do um, from time to time, you know, because uh, I remember um, when I started out, I mean, my, my real passion was sports cars and Formula One and all of that. And, you know, I'd, I left school at 16 to do a traditional engineering apprenticeship and uh, I wanted to do that because it, it, what drove me to do that was I, I wanted to know how to strip these cars down, build them back up, and mm. um, that was really what was driving me. So I remember uh, lying under my car, which cost me fifteen pounds, you know, because and I had to repair it every weekend, side of the street, um, and I would read the um, motorsport magazine, you know, get in cup of tea out the cold yeah. to heat up again. And my, my uh, you know, my real heroes in there were Jackie Stewart and Jim Clark. Mm. And we interviewed Sir Jackie on the podcast, actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I've been very, um, a good friend of Jackie's um, and it, I'm very fortunate to have been invited a couple of years down to his house to go into Grand Prix for the 
British Grand Prix weekend. Mm. And, you know, it was, it was last time I was there, I was pinching myself because I thought, you know, I used to lie out in the rain and cold, mm. fixing an old scrap car up, thinking this guy was, you know, a, my real hero. And I've never dreamt I would be meeting him. But you, it's one of the, the bonuses, I think, of, uh, doing better in your business, you get to meet some really nice people and interesting people. Mm. And did you intend to be this successful businessman and entrepreneur who owns lots of companies and is very well known in your whole nation? Or was it just a journey that manifested itself? Well, I think it's um, you take it in stages because if you started out thinking about where you are just now, then I would, you know, you wouldn't dream it's possible, and people would think you're nuts anyway, and they do think I'm nuts. So, um, mm. uh, you you take it in stages. You know, at first it would be, I want a nicer car, I want a house, I want a nicer house. You know, and <laughs> yeah. then so just in stages, it, it it goes up, and um, you work out what you need to get that, and then work back from that. You mm. know, how do I how do I achieve this? How do I buy this? And then. Uh, work back and see what you need to do to get there. So that sort of drives you forward. Um, mm. But I think when you're starting out, if you're looking at um, the end, uh, it's kind of difficult to 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 take it on board. You know, to get to get your head around it. Mm. So you said just in the middle of that that people think you're crazy. Now I interviewed a, a, yeah. a, a, another billionaire called Naveen Jain, who's the only person in the universe. Uh, so he says, uh, to have a mining license for the moon. He's all about moon shots and, you know, he, he wants to get us off this planet quick. And he's a very big thinker. And he says, if people do not think my ideas are crazy, my ideas are not big enough. And that's his, that's a big yeah. statement he makes. And I did sense a little bit of warmth that came through you when you said people think I'm crazy. Are you okay with that? Do you like people thinking maybe you got big ideas and that kind of thing? Um. Yes, I do like uh, people thinking that I've got big ideas and, and I've been fortunate in a couple of the big ideas to demonstrate that, um, you know, when people said at the beginning, we'll never do that or you're crazy, to have done it, to mm. prove them wrong. So, you know, I, I quite like that, a challenge, you mm. know, uh, to go after. And does it motivate you? Because some people are very motivated by proving people wrong. Well, it's it's not specifically to prove them wrong it's it's um or to prove me right it's you know i if it's a goal i've got i've probably thought it through and and i i believe it is achievable and i've mm. got a plan yeah. you know it sometimes though it's not it's not easy to to get people to to share your confidence about the vision mm. you know so would you define yourself as a businessman an entrepreneur are they separate and two different things, or are they something similar? I think they're very similar. Um, I think the difference is you get a lot of people who are very good businessmen, and they'll talk about doing their own thing. You know, I'd love to do this, I'd love to do that, but they just won't make that step. Um, you know, I've had lots of people come and see me. Oh, I'd I'd like to have my own business, but they're scared. They they won't give up. They won't give up the security mm. of. And, and that's the difference, I think. An entrepreneur will uh, take the leap and, and believe in themselves, mm. you know, that they, they are going to achieve it. You know, when I uh, finished my apprenticeship and I worked for a couple of years as a journeyman, and uh, um, I then decided to go to university for four years. And I was earning a good salary by that time, and my mother thought I was crazy because um, why are you giving up this good job that you've got a great trade um and, and I had to go into students' grants for four years, but I decided that, um, you know, I had to do that to, to mm. move forward to where I wanted to go. Mm. And I, I knew I could do it and I could survive on it. So you, do you have an, an, an appetite or an attitude towards risk then that's maybe, I don't know, a bit more carefree or a bit less concerned than a lot of other people you know? No, I, you know, I think um, sometimes it's the big risk is not doing something. Mm. You know, that that to me is the big risk. You're not going to be able to move <laughs> forward yeah. um, unless you take some risks. Mm. The The idea is to do as much homework as you can uh, to mitigate the risk. And, mm. and um, that's what I'm really uh, focused on with all the businesses I've got. You know, really understand 
the market, be the expert in the, the sector you're in, uh, do as much as you can in learning about the competition, the markets, the products they're looking for, um, and then make the decision. You know, I'm, I've got as much information as I, I can hear. You can assess the risk mm. and um, move forward. Mm. So sometimes with entrepreneurs, it's almost glorified the, the size of the risk they take. Uh, and it's almost like you've got to be losing everything or you're into your last. If, in fact, I think James Dyson was something for like 15 to 20 million in personal debt. And I sometimes think that story is a bit glorified. Do you think you have to risk everything? Or do you think that you can be a bit more, less gung-ho and less all in? You know, they say all or nothing or go, go big or go home. What do you think? Well, I think that? when you're starting out, um, I know when I started taking a bit more risk um, early on, I think you have to. Mm. And I suppose it, you've got less ah, to lose. Because you've got less to mm. lose. It's, it's, it's not as far to fall down. <laughs> and you, ju you just justify to yourself for saying, well, if it doesn't work, I've been here before, mm. but, you know, I'll, I'll do it again. Yeah. But I suppose as you uh, progress um, and you get older, you you know you've got further to fall yes. and uh, it might be more difficult to to climb back up again mm. does that ever make you worry uh, doesn't I'm, I'm always worried uh, <laughs> uh, you know it's, it's very difficult to uh, to get to the stage i think where you don't worry mm. uh, i mean I think everybody does mm. some some people wouldn't admit to it but um, yeah. You know, it's scary. Mm. And how do you deal with that? So I have, we're at a little bit of a benchmark moment. I mean, it's a number, but it's a number, but I really felt it recently. So we're three staff off 100 in our offices. We're at 97. Yeah. And I just got this realization wow, there's 100 people in our office. We, we help pay their mortgages. We, you know, there's the, yeah. the national insurance. We pay on them all, the responsibility. I love, my team and I love being around them. And I've also got this sense of, whoa, this is real. And you get those moments sometimes where you're like, wow, you've got a lot to lose. Yep. Um, and, and how do you cope with that when you continue to grow? Well, I think that's the real pressure. You know, you become responsible for more and more people. And I, and I really feel a responsibility mm. for them. And it, it gets to a point where it's not all about you anymore. <laughs> you know, if, if you do something crazy and it doesn't work, that's fine if it's just you mm. that it affects. But if you've got hundreds or thousands of people that are, um, you know, going to be damaged by what you do, then that that becomes a real burden, and mm. that's what would um, make you lose sleep at night. You mm. know. And how do you manage that? Because you've grown. I mean, it's thousands of staff your companies employ. Yes. Uh, well, I, th I think uh, a way that I. Um, and this this goes back uh, years, you know, that uh, I get into uh, the the concept of, um, well, positive thinking to start with. I mean, I was doing a lot of traveling to the States, and this is years and years ago. Um, all of the bookshops you went into had books on positive thinking. Mm. So I've got a whole library at home of that. Um, and then positive visualization and really having a, a clear vision, a storyboard for where you're going. Um so, you know, I've, I've really, um, focused on, on that side of it, uh, to, to create the picture and then use meditation. Ah. You know, when things are not, um, are maybe a bit challenging, can you just calm yourself down, learn to meditate and spend time working through, um, your challenges in a, in a calm state of mind? Right, so is, is the meditation you do to completely empty your mind or is it to essentially meditate on the challenges that you've got? Um, it's both. But, you know, it's first to empty it and then start to visualise this, this kind of um, positive visualisation. Um, and, you know, it's a, a lot of people worry about, are, am I meditating properly? You know, <laughs> yeah. And and I I went through a phase like that, but I on a trip I had to uh, Thailand one Christmas New Year, I met up with two uh, Buddhist monks, um, an old Buddhist monk and a young one, to teach me how they meditated, uh -huh. and um, that was a kind of breakthrough and just getting comfortable with what I was doing. And what did they teach you? Well, they taught me that it doesn't matter 
what you do. Right. Um, you know, I thought there's some sort of magic technique, <laughs> yeah. but it, it doesn't really matter. It, it's just the concept of calming your mind. You can use different techniques to do that and then different techniques to do your visualization. And um, they they both did a different, they both had different methods. And uh, with both of them, you know, I think I, I was in a meditation with them for an hour and a half and it felt like a minute and a half. Wow. You know? So that's when you know you're really, yeah. you're really, you are meditating. You mm. know, so. And of, of those techniques you learned, which one works best for you? Well, just basically what I was doing before with a couple of tweaks from each of them. But it's what you, you know, it's, it's all about just calming your, yourself down and trying to focus your mind. You, you know, your mind keeps running even in, on, you know, if you've got things that worry you, it's difficult to get them out and, and you can't home in on them. You know, you've got to replace them, flood them out with something positive, something right. different. So that's maybe going back to a time that you remember that you were really euphoric and happy and, and kind of going through it in your mind, you know, mm. um, and that that kind of knocks out all the bad thoughts you've had and it mm. kind of change your biochemistry and just the way you feel. Mm. And um, have you been doing that for a long time? Oh, yes, a long, long time. And if you were to state the key elements of being successful, would that rank in the top things that you said? Yes, it it, it would. I, I, I can give you a you know a story about something that really changed the way mm. I approach the businesses, and it was um, it'd be back in ninety three, I think. Um, I just moved into a new house, the, an old sandstone one that we had to do quite a bit of work to, and then I saw um, on the market advertised a house that I used to cycle past as a wee boy. And it was, uh, you know, huge driveway, lovely big gardens. And I thought, I'm going to go up and um, I'm going to go and see this. So I said to my wife, uh, I was going up to see it. And she said, don't be crazy. You know, you're not going there. We'll just get in here. St stop it. You know, we're not going. So I, I said, I was going up anyway, just have a look. And I went to have a look at it. And um, it, one of these real fancy brochures, because it was an expensive house. There was mm. no way I could have afforded it. You know, it was really quite... Uh, a bit out, well out of my range um, so I took the fancy brochure back down to the house left it in the kitchen worktop I knew she would look at it and <laughs> um, I then uh, said I was going back up on the Saturday to have another look she said well I'll, I'll come with you uh, but we're not buying this okay this you need to get serious here um, so I went up had a look at it and um, I decided I was going to buy it now at that time it was before I bought into my first company of my own and I was acting as a company doctor in in a business where I'd agreed to take a small fee and a share of the upside because I knew I wanted to buy in to a business of my own, but I didn't have capital, didn't come from a rich background, so I had no one to give me the money. I had to build up the capital and the way I, I thought of doing it was acting as a, a company doctor, um, turning around a business that was in trouble mm. Uh, and agreeing to a small fee, so it's not a high cost for them, but a share of the upside. So uh, we were about three months into our um, budget year, and I went back home after seeing this house, and I thought, what would I need to do this year for the share, my share of the upside to allow me to buy this house? Mm. And I worked it back from there, and it, it ended up, it was about two and a half, or three times what the budget was for the year. And we're already three months in and you don't change the budget. You maybe have a an update, you know, a re-forecast, but you don't change the budget. Mm. But I went back, it was a company up in Aberdeen in the oil industry, and I went up on the Monday and I said, look, guys, got them all in. Um, uh, I've been looking at our plan over the, week the weekend and we're just way off the mark in what we can do this year. Um and we're going to change the budget. I know that's not normal, but I don't want that budget there because it'll still be in your mind. I want the new budget in. And they all looked as if it was crazy. And what I'd done with that house, I'd been up to see it two or three times. I'd walked around it. I'd touched the wood panelling. I'd touched the fabrics. I could go through it in my mind. Um, I set what we had to have in the company and broke it back to 
all the actions we'd have to take. And I was absolutely on it every day, what we had to do uh, each day. And also in the morning and at night, I would meditate walking through the house. At the end of the year, we beat the budget, the three times budget. Mm. And it, it made me, and I bought the house. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, when it would I, have when, been a rubbish story. If, well, the when, I, when, when I went back to say that I was going to buy it, I had one other uh, condition. I said, look, I need 10 months for the entry date. And the, the seller said, that's fantastic um, because I'm, I'm going to move to Australia and I don't want to look at houses there until I'm sure I've sold this because mm. I need the money to buy the new house. So I had made this commitment. Um, this guy was in trouble if I didn't follow through. And it was just this absolute focus every day on on the goal, what we needed to do, and walking through in my mind twice a day. Um, and we we managed to, to get the house. Now, the big lesson I had from there was I was very happy with that first budget. And it made me think that very often we settle for goals that are well below what we can achieve. Mm. You know, we, we we don't stretch ourselves enough. So that's what focused me in and really doing a lot more homework and um, testing of the, you know, the, the addressable market, what our share is and the companies we're looking at. So where could we get to? And mm. then set it from there rather than, well, here's where you are. We want to have a 10% growth and that would be great or 20%, mm. that would be great. Start from what you think is achievable and then work back how you can get there. Mm. So, I, you know, it was a lesson on um, how you can, we, we underestimate what, what we're capable of. Mm. And do you still use that kind of methodology, buying companies, other things that you want to attain? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, sometimes it takes a bit longer or sometimes you get the wrong, you get down the wrong path, but that's just a message to tell you you're on the wrong path. You mm. need, you know, you need to go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so um, no, it's uh, so so. This whole idea of um, just taking care of the stress, you know, by trying to calm things down, and it's it's not easy. Sometimes mm. the pressure's quite high. You know, sure. uh, you got to work at it. Yeah. Okay. Great. So that was question one. So, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. so um, something I'm personally, I, I love doing this. Uh, this isn't a job this is brilliant uh, and I always put in a selfish question I'm just being honest about that i.e. Yeah. one not just for all the listeners and the watchers but for me and um, we've acquired two relatively small companies compared to our own over the years but I feel like a couple of years we've probably hit it feels like a bit of a ceiling in our industry where to push through it just doing more marketing or more of the same stuff maybe yeah. is not going to give us that accelerated growth and you I believe from from my research um, on your upward trajectory, bought a lot of companies, bought yep. out competitors, and I'm fascinated by that. So, um, I suppose was that an intention? And then when you did it, how did you do it, and how did it work out? Well, if I, if I go right back to the beginning when I bought this company, Clyde Blowers, it was uh, one of eight, the smallest of eight in the world, doing what it did. Um, and it was too small, uh, really. I'd, and I'd, I'd turned down the, the opportunity to buy it twice before the third time I decided, look, I'll, this keeps coming up. I'm going to do it. Um, so I had done the research on the, the market and I, we were at 3% share of the world market. And I thought if I could get to 15 to 20, that would be a good outcome. So I identified all the competitors, went to see them. Um, just to introduce myself, I bought this company over, you know, we're in the same business, um, just uh, seeing if there's any common ground, you know, that we could work together. I think there's an opportunity for consolidation in this sector. Um, what are your thoughts? You know, just have the general discussion with them. Mm. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't envisage uh, what happened. Um, I eventually bought seven of the eight, including the one that I'd bought, you know, so I had six of the remaining seven. And I ended up, after five years, having spoken to them all, um, well, all except one. 
because one I was too small to talk to, uh, but they eventually had to sell to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, you know, I I had um, I, I was very uh, focused on face to face conversations with people. You know, just get into a a discussion with them, and and then I ended up with sixty percent share of the world market and one competitor. So you went from three percent to sixty percent in five years. Wow! Uh-huh. But it it was about not being threatening to them. I didn't mm. go along and say I want to buy you. I went along and talked about the industry consolidation, and and in a couple of them they thought I was there to sell to them. You mm. know, because they were much bigger, um, and I was here just laying the ground. You know, yeah, uh, for a consolidation that they would they would lead. Um, so. It was a, a softer approach rather mm. than, um, you know, rather, rather than targeting them to take them over. But um, that's that's what I've I've always found that if you um, if you call someone up, quite nine times out of ten they'll they'll see you um, and just go and have a chat with them and see where it goes, and mm. then you can start forming your your plan once you've assessed where they all are. Yeah. Yeah, well, wasn't this one um, that wasn't it losing quite a lot of money when you bought it? Yes, it was. Um, it, well, it's a lot of money, relatively speaking. Mm. It was losing, I think, about two hundred and fifty thousand a year. Um, but when I and, and I thought it was too small because it was only turning over three million. Right. Um, and in my experience, I had as a a company doctor. Um, I usually found that you had to cut out some of the business. You know, there was, you looked at the products in there, there are probably some that were loss making. You cut them out. There's not a lot of fat in there, you know, for, for a three million turnover to, uh, to cut out. So I, I was looking at something, and this was my first company I was targeting. I was looking for something that at least 10 million turnover that I mm. could work with. Um, but when I looked at it, um, I found out that it had a, a share portfolio worth two and a half million, and it had three properties on an industrial site that was the only industrial site um, right next to a, a retail outlet, you know, a retail centre, mm. um, out of town retail centre, um, and it was it was obviously ripe for selling to a retail developer much higher value so by selling the um the property and the share portfolio i was able to raise about five and a half million now this this company was listed on the stock market at the time when i bought 29.9 percent of it and when i'm when i bought 29.9 it was valued at two and a half million and it had all of this value in it and it wasn't until i looked at it that i could see the value. So mm. I was getting five and a half million um, and a company, um, you know, sold the property, sold the share portfolio, mm. and I got I got the, the company for free, really, you yeah. know, and a, and a bit of bonus and what I'd paid. Wow. So um, that was... Um, and has this all come about because of the experience you got being the company doctor? Yes. Um mm. You know, I'd I'd uh, I'd gone to university, as I said, went back to work as a kind of senior management, junior manager to start with in engineering, and then sort of worked my my way up. But at the same time, I'd done a an MBA and then a, a masters, an MA, a masters in international finance and accounting, um, and I was headhunted by Coopers and Lybrand at the time. This is before they merged with Price Waterhouse. Mm. Um, and it was to go in as a, a a senior consultant to look at companies in trouble that, and mainly industrial businesses, you know, because that was my background and I had the financial training, so it was um, ideal. But I, I really got some some good experience in there. Didn't like working. I was only in there for two years. Didn't like that kind of role. I wanted to get into business of my own, mm. but it was a huge learning experience and very good training from them on just how to analyse different parts of a business and what to look for. Mm. Um, and if you could give us like the top three things you learned 
Well, the top the that. top one that they told you was if you can put the prices up, then that's the easiest way to, <laughs> yeah. to make the company more profitable, you know. Yeah. Um, and then a second one was, and the kind of business I was in was engineering and industrial businesses, to to try and do a P&L for each product or each activity. Mm. And you probably find that there's a couple that are sucking a lot of money yeah. out of the company and losing money. Now, it may be that they are the, you need to do them to get the other stuff. Mm. But if you don't, then, um, it, you know, it kind of, it, it, it shows you where you can improve your profitability and save costs immediately. Yeah. So that, that's something that we've used, um, quite, quite a bit. And then I, I guess the third one is just the, um, this whole thing about having a, a plan. It's amazing the number of places you went in to see and they didn't have a plan. You know, um, I'd be going in to see people that I would read about in the newspaper and get excited the night before I was going in. And then you'd come away from the meeting and think, surely it can't be that simple. Uh, you know, the, the challenge they had, to me it seemed that it was obvious what the, the challenge was. Um, but I think one of my advantages, having done my apprenticeship and then worked on the shop floor, the first thing I did when I went into a business was go down and talk to people. Mm. And usually you find the answer there. And then you go up and tell the bosses what the answer <laughs> is and they think you're smart. Yeah. You see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well they're on the front line, aren't yeah, they? They're, yeah. They're doing it all. So that 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 kind of that's worked quite a bit. Just speak to people in the business <laughs> yeah. further down. Yeah. There's a common theme here, it seems. A, a non threatening and non threatening approach. And just talking to people and extracting information from having conversations. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Uh, and do you think that's done as much as it should be in the modern business world? Now we're all behind social media and email and everything else. No, I think I think that's kind of taken over from uh, people just getting even getting out their office and walking to speak to people. Yeah. Um, you know, you can see them sending text messages or emails, mm. and you know they're meeting <laughs> yeah, in an office yeah. across the way instead of. Yeah. Just opening the door. It's why we've designed this with a big open area out there. Right. You know, people can yeah. just walk out and chat to each other. And uh, mm. um, I think maybe there's a bit of that missing now. Mm. And and um, also with travel, I I used to if I wanted to meet someone in in the states, for example, I would say I'm going to be in your neighbourhood next week. Can I come and see you? The classic salesman's life. Yeah, yeah. Once they uh, once they said. Yes, I would then book the flight yeah. and see them. Yeah. Um, but they wouldn't, you know, if, if they thought you were going to all that effort to go and see them, they wouldn't, mm. they wouldn't agree, mm. you know. Well, we find that because we've, um, we've done now, this will be nearly 500 podcast episodes. It's quite a lot. And we do some on Skype if they're in America or whatever, but it's so much better when you get in the car and you go and meet the person yes. face to face yes. and you set up the cameras and we can get a feel for your offices, your space. Yep. I think there's more rapport than if there was a slightly laggy Skype connection and Yes. Yeah, we No, and you better. can you it's better. You can you pick up a lot more um mm. uh, speaking direct to someone than you do even over Skype, mm. you know. Um I think a lot of people hide as well. It's, yes. I've I've I talk to people because I help a lot of entrepreneurs. Um and they're like, Oh yeah, I'll send them an email. And I'm thinking, no, 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 you're just hiding behind that. Yeah. You need to pick up mm. the phone and talk to them. We'll go and see them. Uh, and you know you have some big problems. You go and see and meet the person. That can yep. be that can re remove a lot of the issues. Yes. Uh huh. You know, I remember when we bought um, we bought a number of businesses from a company in the US called Textron. Um, you know, they do Bell helicopters, mm. Citation jets, and so on. And it was a particular business I wanted. I I had bought the business that I'd served my apprenticeship in. Um, uh, oh, you went back and bought it? Yes. Oh, nice. That uh, must have felt good. No, it, was, it, it felt quite good. And when I walked around the shop floor, there were some guys there that I'd served my apprenticeship <laughs> but still, <laughs> still working there. And um, I remember one of them saying to me, he, he'd gone home and his wife had said to him, how come that guy's buying the company and you're still working down <laughs> there? And he said, I said to her, I married you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, <laughs> um, but you, you, there's really good sort of... Um, banter and joking mm. from these guys down there and and they all you need to do is treat people fairly mm. and communicate well and you get 
you get a lot more out of them productivity wise. Mm. But it was a good feeling, and and then I had identified a, a business that I really wanted that Textron had. It was the perfect match for it, but it wasn't for sale. Mm. So I just used the old trick I'd like to come over and see. You know, I bought this business. It's in the same uh, same line as one you've got, and I just like to share thoughts with you. Um, and they told me it wasn't for sale. And then I went back to twice after that. And eventually, I, I was getting a good relationship with a guy, mm. one of the vice presidents. <coughs> and he uh, he said to me, look, Jim, uh, I like having lunch with you and dinner, but we're, we're never going to sell this business. Then he said the key words, the only way you <laughs> would consider it is if you bought the whole division and there were three other businesses in it. And I said, okay, I'll do that. Mm. And he, you know, he looked at me surprised and I said, look, I, I've been looking at the other businesses you have and they fit with the kind of thing we want to do. Now, we had raised a fund based on that alongside our own money. And as we got towards the end, the banking crisis was getting kind of bad. We did this in 2008 and we closed it three days before Lehman Brothers collapsed. Wow. But just coming up to the closing two weeks before, someone, and this was a big deal, you know, this was in total about a billion dollar deal. Mm. Um, someone who was going to pay me uh, or, or invest 50 million uh, asked me to go back and cut the price, chip the price. Now, one of the, the ways that I had got the, the confidence of this guy and the trust was I said, look, other private equity firms are going to come and give you this wonderful price. I said, they always chip it once they get in to do the diligence. I'll give you my word that if we give you a price, the only way we'll reduce it is if there's something obvious that you agree to that is different from what you told us. So they were asking me to go back and chip the price. Right. And then they said, well, if you're not going to do it, um, we're out. So I lost 50 million, an investor that was putting 50 million pounds in um, two weeks before we had to close the deal. So I went over to see the individual I was dealing with in Textron. I said to him, you know, I told you <laughs> I wouldn't uh, chip the price. Um, well, I'm not going to do it, but I need you to give me a loan note for 50 million and I'll pay you back within two or three years, but you need to give me a loan note for 50 million. And I told him why. And he, there was a silence that seemed to last hours, but it was probably only a few minutes. And then he, he said, okay, I'll do it. Um, and our lawyers, our accountants were helping us with the diligence, thought there was no chance we would, um, we would get there. But it was always, it was the trips over establishing the relationship with them. If I hadn't done that, um, he probably wouldn't have said, yes, I'll lend you 50 million. Mm. Um, and he got it back within two years. So, mm. um, and he's, uh, he's a very good reference to use if, you know, when we're doing deals with people. Mm. How many companies, if you break them all up, have you acquired in your lifetime, would you say? Do you know, honestly, I don't know. I don't know. Wow, well, you must have done a lot of deals. Back. I'd need to go back. Would and, it be 50, 100? Uh, I think more? it'd be more than 50. Yeah, um, wow. It'd be, certainly be more than 50. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And what I'm sitting here thinking is, how did you fund all of those? Was it just progressively buying bigger companies? Did you start with your own money? Did you do some sort of turnarounds? Or did you, were you always just good at raising money in funds and from private investors? No, well, um, the start was. Um, as I said to you, I decided to build up some capital with this um, share of the upside on mm. deals that I, turnarounds I went into doing. They were all they all worked. They were all successful. All right. And in fact, in the last one, they had to buy me out of the the share of the upside deal because it was getting uh, embarrassing. They said for them, but uh, um, so they they bought me out of that, and that gave me the capital to buy into my first company, and then. You're then growing your own capital after that, mm. you know, and um, so we built we built up funds of our own. Uh, I took the company private, took it off the stock market, 
and probably from 1999 through till 2007, 2008, it, it was myself and three partners I had uh, who were using their own money to, to fund uh, businesses and maybe bringing in a co-investor alongside us. The model we had was we would put in 70% of the capital, get someone to put in 30 um, and then some bank debt in, and that's how we funded them. Mm. Uh, and then to do this bigger deal, you know, the the deal from Textron, we had we thought we'd go out and raise a, a fund. Mm. And that's when we, we went and raised some outside money to, to come in. But it, it was much easier, I think, for us on the deal by deal basis because you're not dealing with, I, pre- I prefer to just be dealing with our own money, maybe one or two outside investors. But, you mm. know, when you get into a fund, you've got a lot more and a lot more responsibility mm. and you need more people in to, to manage all of that. You know? And how did you... Um, move into doing that. How did you get your head round using other people's money? Well, I, I, um, in the last job that I was in, that I, I spoke about, you know, in the the when I was getting a share of the upside, part of the the deal there and or the turnaround that I did was they had two different types of businesses involved in the offshore industry, and um, I decided that best to sell one and to focus on growing the other one. Um, And I sold it to an American private equity firm. And uh, they asked me to go on the board of the company in the States. So I would be over there at board meetings and getting a lot of exposure to um, the the particular private equity company over there. Um, And, you know, I was learning about how they did it, how you set this kind of thing up, what the the structures are like. And I'd been looking at this for a while uh, before we actually did it. I'd, I tried, you know, we had, we've, we've listed um, two companies or three companies on, on the AIM market and then sold them uh, because the, the market was, that was when I was trying to exit some and keep, keep a stake in it, but have access to raising more capital. Um, but, uh, you know, the market's not always efficient and quite often it can undervalue these businesses um, mm. for no logical reason. And, and two that we sold, uh, the last two that we sold, one of them, the share price was down at 18p and we sold it for 80-odd p. Wow. And it shows you how inefficient the market can be in valuing things. And then another one we sold for three times what it was valued at in the market. Mm. And it's, that's still a good fishing ground for good businesses because they're quite often they're they're undervalued and they're small mm. so there's not a lot of liquidity in them and you could maybe take them private mm. so it's it's an area that we look at as well for potential deals yeah earlier on in in that answer you said and I just want to check that this wasn't a thing but you said um there was a company and it was on the stock exchange and you took it off and made it private again yeah. Was that because you don't like having your companies on the stock exchange or was that, is it, because, you know, some no, that, people some people like to keep their companies private, don't they? Yes. Well, the, the reason was, you know, I, I, I told you that I'd done a, a, an MBA and then a, a master's in finance. In the master's in finance, we had a, a, a professor there who taught us about efficient market theory and the stock market, so the market's always efficient, gets things right. Um, and I believe that up until 1997, when you had the Southeast Asian crisis, where the current, you know, the, the one by one, I think it started in Indonesia, or Malaysia, and then there was a picture in the front of The Economist of the world melting. Everybody thought this was going to be a meltdown. So the stock market came way off. And our our share price went from what it was to 25% of its value over a three-month period. Mm. And, you know, at first this is a real blow to your ego because you think you're pretty well off and then all of a sudden you're only worth 25% of what you yeah. were three months later. Mm. Um, and there was th- this company was growing well above 20% per year. It was performing very well. There was no logical reason. It was just market sentiment. Mm. Um 
investors didn't want to be trapped in an, it was a small company, so they didn't want to be trapped in an illiquid investment if there was going to be this long downturn in the market economy. Mm. So um, we decided that, you know, we need to buy this back, yeah. uh, need to get it off the market. Right. Mm. Um, and we paid at that time, and it might still be a record premium to take it private. Um, we paid quite a significant premium, and we still got it for the fraction of what it was worth. Um, mm. And it turns out what happened after that um, showed us that even at the the price before it went down, it was undervalued because we made a lot more out of that by taking it private, um, building the comp- continuing to grow the company. Mm. And that's when we started. We brought in a 30% investor, you know, and we started to, um, to, or we continued to grow the business, which we couldn't do on the market because nobody's going to, you're not going to be able to raise money in a market like that. Or if you do, the existing shareholders, and of which we were probably the biggest, is going to be diluted. Mm. Um, so that's why I, I went off the market. Then I thought AIM was quite good because that was the main market. I thought AIM was going quite well and maybe maybe that was more efficient. But the same thing happened uh, twice. Mm. So because I'd only floated uh, maybe 25 or 30% of the company, still owned the majority, then I was able to... Um, put them up for sale. Do you remember the moment you found out when you were going to be awarded the OBE? Yes. Could you tell us about it? Well, um, it was a letter that came through the post and it well, said... Um, most of us don't know what happened. Uh, well, so. you get a letter from, uh, I believe it was from Downing Street, and it, it says that um, the it, it doesn't tell you you're going to get it. It uh-huh. kind of says if... If you were recommended, would you be up for receiving it? You know, oh, and, really? And, yeah. and they're reviewing it. They don't tell you that you're going to get it at that time. So you you respond and say, yes, that would be, you know, mm. that'd be an honour to, uh, to get that. And then um, you don't really hear much about it until closer to the time and they, you know, they come on and tell you. Yeah. Um, and how do they tell you? Um I think it was another letter that I got. I can't remember. Is it got like a specific envelope? Like, you know. Well, you you can tell that you know that it's got the it's Ten Downing Street yeah. on it. So um, and it's the at that time it was the Prime Minister that was um, mm. recommending me for it. Right, and did you read it on your own? Did you show it to anyone else? No, Were I read it. My, I read it in my own first, and then um, I I shared it with my wife, and, mm. and we just kept it. Because they tell you not mm. to, you know, it is. It's worded in a way that um, you're scared to tell anyone because they might not give you. <laughs> yeah, you know? it sounds very clever. The way yes, they do it. it's very, it's very well done. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now you've also got tons of business awards for all the research that we've done. So OBs and business awards. What's your take on those? Do they make you feel fulfilled? Do they have no bearing on how you feel about yourself? Do, how do you feel about awards and recognition? No, I think, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier to you um, that we had this organisation in Scotland called the Entrepreneurial Exchange, where it was uh, it was all just entrepreneurs in it, and it was um, focused in us where we would pick a subject like, um, you know, uh, acquiring a business or funding or something that was of interest. And those, those focused dinners were maybe about, 16 people max um, held once a month and then we would have an evening with people and some bigger names along where you can ask questions just to share experiences. Um, uh, so, I, you know, that was, um, that was uh, really, I think, a, a great way to, um, to learn, you know, from, from your peers and, and um, help help the whole thing going forward. Mm. Because I sometimes think awards should mean nothing because they don't change who you are. Like, for example, let's say you become a best-selling author. Well, you already wrote the book. The book is as good as the book is. I I, I know, but, um, you know, just uh, to to finish on the the Entrepreneurial Exchange, they had annual awards. Mm. 
and the entrepreneur of the year was the big prize. Right. And, you know, we're all quite competitive. So yeah. you did feel really good when you got it. Mm. I got it in 2000. The gathering would be 700 people at the award ceremonies, but they thought, year 2000, we're going to have 2000 people. <laughs> Wow. And there were 2,000 people at the award ceremony, yeah. and and I won it that year. I was the Entrepreneur of the Year. So you, you know, you get a bit of a kick out of that. Mm. And then um, uh, I got the Anson Young Master Entrepreneur of the Year. So yeah. I think they do, they, they help kind of um, lift you. But the other thing they do is um, uh, it's good for the team, mm. you know, that, that everybody in the business that, they see that um, you're getting, you know, you're getting recognition for what you're doing, and they feel proud about the business yeah. because that's that's really who got the award, not not me personally. You know, mm. it's the it's the team. I I get all the credit for it, but yeah. um, the other people that do the work. Mm. Well, it's nice to hear that because I think maybe some people aren't honest about that. I think external validation for the work you've done is also equally on merit, maybe less so, but on merit as internal validation. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. Mm. No, I think I think they're they're um I think they're positive. You know, I think uh I'm not so sure about these uh, this rich list stuff and everything, you know. Although it 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 does have its advantages because people read about it and you, you find you get invited to things right. that you wouldn't otherwise get invited <laughs> yeah. to. You know, so um yeah. it has its positive side. But I think uh uh, you know, at the time of the banking crisis, uh, I thought it was a bit distasteful to be putting those sort of things out, you mm. know. Um, and uh, People do like to read them, though, don't they? Uh, yeah, they do. Mm. But um, and, and might I be so bold as to say that's okay for someone to say who's been in said rich list. It's like when billionaires say, oh, well, you know, it's not about the money, but they're already billionaires. What about us who want to make money or be successful or no, get what, in a rich I, th- I think when, you, when you're in it the first time, it's, it's just like getting the award, mm. you know. But um, then uh, there's maybe more negatives come from it. Than, like? Well, I think people do, I, it, I do get jealous as they see you. Some people do as they see you mm. rising up. And then, uh, you know, you also... Uh, we're in Scotland. Scot- Scotland doesn't like, you know, this is the tall poppy syndrome. Scotland doesn't like people getting too successful. Yeah. I, I find UK is a bit like that as well. Mm. Um, is, do you think Scotland's worse then or more like that? Oh, well, they, they, you don't get away with um, uh, with that kind of thing here. No. Because no. a, a friend of mine, Scottish, and he said that um, he will not have his wife give him praise publicly. Just won't have it, and he said he thinks that's quite a, Scot- a Scottish thing. And I just thought, wow, yeah, it's that kind surprised of me. Strange, but you know, I, it's funny. I don't think um, I don't think I've changed um, uh, over the past. You know, since I was working in the the shop floor, obviously I have a bit, mm. but my value my values haven't changed. You know, I still I I think I I can't stand people who. Um, uh, are not respectful to others, you know, and treat them well and mm. so on. I, I just don't like that kind of uh, bullying type of approach that some people get, you know, they, they think that if you earn a bit more money, it makes you smarter, mm. <laughs> you know. And no, I can have to make you more stupid. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. You know. So do you I, think you're naturally humble or Scotland has kept you humble or both? I, I would like to think I'm, I'm fairly humble. Um and I, I think it's just your environment and mm. how you've been brought up. You know, I was always brought up to be respectful of other people. Yeah. Um, and and I think, I mean, when I, I started out in the as, as an apprentice, I mean, I had lots of other jobs like, you know, fitting tyres, selling petrol and so on. Mm. And, I, and I always wanted to do my job really well. So I really admire people who have got that attitude towards the job. doesn't matter what the job is. Yeah. If you're doing that, to, you know, if you're very proud of it, then that's equal to being very proud about buying businesses or making great businesses. I don't think there's a difference. Mm. So um, this first question is leading into the, to the second question. Um, do, do you mind sharing what the group turnover is of your companies? Uh, um, 
I don't know what it'll be just now. Um, uh, with all the companies we're invested in, it be because we've sold we've sold a couple. Um, uh, so, and and we're in the phase of buying. You know, looking at some more. Mm. It, it's probably um, over a billion. Wow! Uh, if you add them all up. Mm. And so my question then is, have there been some personal sacrifices you've had to make along the way from going from a chap who's passionate about cars and fixing them on the side of the road to a billion pound plus turnover? Um, sac- yeah, you sacrifice a lot of your time, uh, you, you know, your personal time. And uh, I suppose um, early on you, you, you take some big risks, you know, and... Um, I was always very focused in what I was doing, so quite often you don't take into account the impact it's having on others, you know, and the family and so on, and your wife, you know. Um, and what uh, is that impact? Well, you're you're being selfish, you know. Mm. You're you're kind of doing what you want to do, and you're not thinking of the the effect it has on them. Mm. Do you have children? I do. Mm. And did did it ever affect the time you spent with them? Early on, it did. Mm. Yes. Uh, but I'm very fortunate that late, later on, two of my three uh, work with me. Ah. Or, well, one works with me now. The other one ran one of our businesses that I sold last year, so mm. I sold her with the business. Um, <laughs> How does she feel about that? <laughs> well, she's actually doing very well with the, the new owner. She's mm. been given more responsibility and she's doing a great job. Yeah, And that's good for her as well because very often when she was in here, I would be worried that, People think she's got the job because she's my daughter, you mm. know, but she's actually doing extremely well mm. in under this uh, an Italian private equity firm that bought the business, and mm. um, she's she's moved up in that organisation as well. Mm. So, was there a moment in your business career where you actually thought, "Wait a minute, I need to focus back on my family and not there be so much attrition of time around"? Yeah, probably the last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I've, I've maybe been too focused on the business because um, mm. uh, I enjoy what I do. You know, yeah. I love I love what I do. It's not it's not business. It's just like you said earlier. This isn't. It's not a job. It's, it's not a job. No. Um, you know, it's uh, something that I enjoy doing. Mm. And is is that therefore about being around people who understand that about you and accept that? Is you? Yes. Choosing the right yes. people? That's the, absolutely. I think that's right. Mm. Okay. Um, we've got a few more quick firers now. now you right. can answer them as long as you like, but if, okay. you, if you also want to answer them as short as you like, that's also fine. That would be better. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what's been your greatest failure and what did you learn from it? Um, probably people. You know, it's selecting people is, is the greatest failure. Um, and I've learned from it that you need to be a wee bit um, probably uh, tougher early on when you find things aren't working, you know, right. you, and you tend to give people um, a bit more time and try and work with them and so on. But it's better for them and you if you identify that early on. I, th- mm. I would think that would be probably the biggest failure. So that's... Is that about selecting the wrong person or is that just about not managing, managing them well enough? Well, it's a, co- it's a combination of both. Mm. Um, uh, selecting, it, it, in some cases, it's selecting the wrong person. In, in maybe one case, it's about not managing them well enough. Mm. You know? And, and you're, you're a believer in um, addressing issues early. Yes, I think you have to. But I do think you... Or I have thought up until recently, you have to give people a bit of a chance, you know. Um, yeah, because you can't expect someone to slot in and be no, a genius straight away, can you? No, but uh, sometimes, uh, you know, time passes very quickly mm. and um, uh, you can get into habit. It can be habit forming and it's more difficult. The, the longer you let something run, it's more difficult to, mm. to change the behaviour. Mm. Are you money motivated? And if you're not, what motivates you? Of of course I am. Yes, um, uh, I think uh, people who say they're not are lying. <laughs> uh, um, are you listening? Yeah, 
because, or don't um, have any, or 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 don't have any. But uh, I think um, yes, I am. Mm. I mean, uh, when I was doing my apprenticeship, I took other jobs at the weekend because I was money motivated. Mm. Um, I wanted a better car. I wanted you know to do different things. Mm. So, uh, and it's just it just steps up. What's your typical day? There's, I don't know that there's a typical day. I mean, I I get up in the morning. Uh, Are you an early riser? I am. Uh, like this morning, I was up at three o'clock, you know, but uh, I I went to bed early last night. So you, I just start doing some work on some of the projects we're looking at. Um, I like playing about with numbers, you know, so um, I can spend a lot of time doing that. Mm. Uh, today, coming in, I suppose it's fairly typical. Um, I did my to-do list when I got up at three o'clock, so I had a couple of pages and I just started working through that. And, of course, people come in and interrupt you, so you you don't get through what you're doing. You've got to go back and do it. I, I need to be more disciplined that way. Mm. Which I think we can all say, can't yeah. we? Yeah. And then it's probably working till late at night as well. Um, yeah. uh, in fact, you don't really switch off. To, it, from the moment I get up till the moment I go to sleep, during the week it's usually, um, or for at least four days of the week, it's uh, that's the pattern. Mm. And then I like to get home at the weekend and get a bit of sun and mm. uh, uh, relax a bit. Mm. Okay. Um, MBA or real life on the ground experience? Well, you know, I quite often get asked because I did my MBA and I did um, but the real life on the ground experience. And I think uh, I wouldn't give give up. I think the, the, the on the ground experience has served me more in doing what I'm doing than the MBA. Mm. But, but would you, you change do, it or would you still do it if you no, I'd, I'd do the same yeah. because um, I, I believe all of this goes into your kind of subconscious and mm. you then do things by gut feel, but it's not really gut feel. It's stuff that you've put in there mm. coming to the fore when you've got a particular problem. And I'm sure there's lots of stuff in my MBA and the other degrees I've done that um, I just do automatically because it's in there. Yeah. And I don't know what it would be like if it wasn't in there. Mm. Um, but I, I mentioned to you earlier about getting into companies, walking around, talking to people. I know people that have never been on working in that level are actually kind of scared to mm. go down and deal with these people because they see them as different, yeah. you know, um, or in terms of the language and, you know, the buzzwords they use. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that on-the-ground experience is absolutely key. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we now have, we've, about 50 episodes ago, we decided to freshen things up on the podcast and we've introduced a cheeky round. Right. So, yeah, we get mixed response. They've gone quite well so far, but these questions are a bit more cheeky. Um, I, to be honest, I'm not, some of these aren't as cheeky as some other people I've asked. I asked one person his net worth and he shot me right down. Um, but what I tend to do is get feedback from the listeners and ask questions that they like me to ask. So we understand you're a bit of a petrol head. What's the most you've ever spent on a car? Um, I think 350,000. And what car was that? Well, that was, uh, that was a, ben a special Bentley Azure that I bought in uh, Monaco. And in Monaco... The cars are all more expensive because um, the tax system is mm. different there. Everybody said it's tax free, it's not tax free. No, you're just paying it when you buy. You stuff, pay it right? when if you buy a big car, you pay a lot of tax on the mm. big car. If you're in a big house, you pay a lot of tax on the big house. So it's in it's it's indirect tax. It's not direct tax. Yeah, but you probably end up paying as much as you would, mm. you know. And, but I paid more for the car. Right. Yeah. And if you could like, what's your favourite car that's ever been built? Um, I think the one I would like to have is a um, Bugatti Chiron, ah. not the Veyron, yeah. uh, the Chiron. That's a machine. Yep. Yeah. All right. Buy a few more companies. What was it you did for your house? You just need to. 
Yep, I need the to, budget. I'll need, to, I'll need <laughs> yeah. to. We should do that. Get yeah. a bit more. Uh, get a bit more ambitious. I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Um, now, uh, you nearly, uh, from my research, so correct me if I'm wrong, you nearly purchased Rangers Football Club in 2010, and we couldn't find out exactly why or what happened. Are you able to talk about that? Yeah. No, I. I didn't nearly purchase it. Um, what happened was uh, Rangers Football Club had been taken over by people who were um, exploiting it mm. and were out to kind of asset strip it in our view. Right. And people from outside of Scotland um, right. who, you know, don't understand how important both Rangers and Celtic are in Glasgow. Yeah. And I'm uh, a Glaswegian, so... We couldn't allow this to happen. It did a lot of damage, but right. um, myself and uh, one other, um, a chap called Paul Murray, who ended up on the board, um, we decided that we were going to get rid of the people that were in there. And um, we uh, we held a special shareholders meeting. We managed to get them uh, put out. We, we ran up quite an expensive um, bill. I, I wasn't a shareholder before all this happened, but I bought shares so that I could go to the AGM and the, the special meetings mm. and, in fact, call them. Um, and then when we finished, I gave the shares to the um, supporters club. What? I gifted them to them and mm. paid the hefty tax bill between me and, and Paul, and we got it back on to um, an even keel. Wow. But I... Uh, at no time in my mind was I going to buy it. No. Although, I'm glad I asked. It's, although um, yeah. I might think differently now because uh, you know I was I was learning about this uh, technique that was used in Moneyball. You know the where yes, we, and you know do you know that's what's happening in Liverpool? Well, I'm a, I'm a Liverpool fan. The owners owned the um, I think was it baseball club that Moneyball was yes. filmed about. Yeah, so it's the same technique they're using. Yeah, ah. and. I mean, you see 22 points ahead yeah. of everyone else. Yeah. Um, so buying these apparent misfits. Yes, and just yeah. using this technique. So it's nice to think about them being 22 points ahead of Celtic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, now, there was something that went around the UK and it, it did get under my skin a little bit because I'm very pro-capitalism and money. I think a lot of people who are anti it don't realize the good that a lot of philanthropists do etc and there's this bit of campaign a campaign in the uk and it was on the major news which is like the world doesn't need billionaires right what do you think about that well um it, it probably doesn't need them but that doesn't mean to say they're bad people mm. um i've met a lot of nice billionaires mm. um but you know i it, it's just this thing i was talking about earlier where um, there's this tall poppy syndrome, you know, they, they don't like it. Mm. I, I think um, uh, it's wrong to generalise like that. I'm sure there's some real nasty people. Um, but there are just also some probably nasty poor people as yes, well, aren't they? Yes. Mm. Uh, mm. And, it, you know, it's not it's not about money, I don't think. You've got to be happy mm. <laughs> as well. That's kind of important. Mm. And has money made you more happy, less happy, or is money and happiness unrelated? I oh, know I think they are related. You know, it's allowed me to do things that I wouldn't otherwise have been a able to do that make me happy. Mm. Like, like um, you know, going uh, to Grand Prix that I wouldn't have gone to, and just the kind of places you're able to visit, the people you meet. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be meeting those people. I wouldn't be living in Monaco. Mm. Um, you know, what took me there in the first instant was I used to read about the Monaco Grand Prix and I was desperate to go there. And when I went there, I, I thought, this is a fabulous place. When, mm. when I can afford it, I'm going to live here. Right. But then people think that the plan is you go there to, to um, avoid tax. It's, it's not. that. Well, that certainly wasn't the driver. And mm. as I said earlier, it, if you want to have your big car and you want to have a nice house and you want to eat out nice, you're paying a lot of tax anyway. Mm. So um, they just get you a, one way or just another. a different way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. This is the cheeky one. I've warmed up for this one. Right. Has anyone ever propositioned you because of your wealth? What do you mean by proposition? I was intentionally vague with that word. 
Um, yeah. Like, have you ever been asked out or has someone randomly asked you for something because they know you're wealthy and successful? Oh, you, you, you quite often you get approached because, you, yes, lots wow. of times. Yeah. Wow. All right. Have, well, we're all going to get yeah. rich there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. So best advice you ever received, and you can do even quicker fire if you want. The business that you're in is the best business to be in. Worst advice you ever received? I suppose not to do some things that I've done, you know. In fact, maybe not to go to university. You know, I was told not to do that. Mm. I had a good job and a good future. Mm. Okay. Um, Now, on podcasts, there's a common question which says, what advice would you give to your younger self? And I want this podcast to be unique, so we've spun it on its head. What advice would you give to your, your older self? Like maybe, you know, you're only a couple of years away from the end of your life. What advice would you give to him? Well, do, do what you're happy doing, you know, don't, and spend time with people that you enjoy being with. Mm. Lovely. Um, is there one thing that's wrong in the world that you would like to change or see differently? Yes, governments and, and democracy. Mm. <laughs> Enough said about that. That's a whole other podcast. Okay, and then finally, this podcast is called The Disruptive Entrepreneur. And I always like to ask every guest, what's your definition of a disruptive entrepreneur or that word? Well, I think it's, um, it, it's, it's a lot of what we do, you know, taking over businesses is thinking about them a different way and, and being disruptive. You know, you're... Um, you're you're um you're thinking the opposite or quite different from the way people are looking at uh, a particular business problem uh, you come in with something off of left field mm. to everyone else yeah um and you've got to have the you, you know you've got to have the tenacity to keep pushing to break everything up so that you can put it put it back together again mm. Well, look, on behalf of everyone on the live and the podcast and us, I just want to say a huge thank you, Jim. Okay, I hope it was okay. Oh, I've had a lot of fun. So yeah, thank you very much. Too. Thank you.